Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, and I am your host. Over the course of this show, we will learn about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored today to have our guest on the show. Please help me welcome to the show City of Whitehorse Mayor Laura Cabot. Laura, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here. So, Laura, let's get the first question out of the way, and you're no exception to the first question, and that is, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, you know, Chris, I, I became interested in, in municipal politics, uh, what was happening in my community uh, when I was about a teenager, so whatever that was, 50 years ago, uh, 45, 50 years ago. My mom uh, was a school board trustee in, in uh, the lower mainland in British Columbia. Then she moved on to be a city councillor. They were called aldermans back then. Uh, and she was very much involved in serving her community as a politician, uh, but also in uh, a number of uh, not-for-profit or organizations, whether it was starting the first um, transition home for women or recycling back in the you know 40 years ago, so that's where I got some of that uh, some of that interest, and um, I just generally is kind of interested in what was happening in my community and and how how I could get involved even at a young age. So it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but politics was discussed at the dinner table growing up. And I want to know, because your mother was involved as a school board trustee, as an alderman, was it more municipal or was it provincial and federal that was more talked about around the dinner table? Or was it a mixture of all three? You know, it it, it depended on what, what the issue was of the day. Um, so, um, you know, whether it was uh, something to do uh, at, at the at the school, whether it was um, I mean I grew up riding horses and so there was a it was quite a horse community in 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 Maple Ridge and so there was there were uh, municipal discussions about uh, increasing trails, taking away trails, uh, investing in 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 some infrastructure. Um, so you know at a, a municipal level it. it it was important that the area that I lived in, it was subject to flooding. So we were always aware of uh, when flooding was going to happen and when municipal services came to, to assist or whether there was an emergency and you had to leave. And then on, on, on the other side, on the federal side of things, um, I got involved one year in a campaign just because my, my father was, uh, he was a contractor and he, he had built uh, some, uh, some infrastructure didn't go well. Uh, he sued the federal government. Uh, it ended up going quite well for him. And before you know it, he had my uh, my my sister, my brothers, campaigning against this federal fisheries minister in a federal uh, campaign. So we all got excited in that. And uh, so it just it just depended on what what the issue was before us. But it was just um, taking an interest in what was sort of happening around uh, in in your community. Now, seeing your mother being an elected official, did you ever think to yourself when you were watching her as a young child say, I'm going to be a politician one day, I'm going to follow in my mother's footsteps and be on the ballot one day? Or was that something so far outside your mind until later on in your life in 2018 when you finally decided to put your name on the ballot? Uh, I have to say no, absolutely not. My uh, my my disposition is I'm a little bit shy, and so actually getting out in front of people and knocking on doors and engaging with uh, strangers, uh, absolutely not. But my interest was more on uh, campaigning, strategizing, supporting my mom or whoever can who whomever's campaign I was involved in, uh, ordering the signs, writing speeches, going to rallies. So I was I was always interested in politics and campaigns, but I was a little bit shy to actually uh, end up being uh, being a politician. So it is a bit, uh, if people knew me from my childhood and growing up uh, as a young adult, uh, they would think, hmm, she wasn't the one that I would pick who would end up being <laughs> the mayor of Whitehorse. So when did you move from Maple Ridge to Whitehorse? Or I'm assuming there might've been some moves in between the two cities, but when did you officially set up a shop in Whitehorse? 
1992, because uh, I graduated from university. I had a phys ed degree and a law degree and was looking for a job. Uh, and I came north to Whitehorse uh, for a job. I uh, thinking that I would just stick around for a couple of years, uh, take in, you know, make some money, get, you know, get some you know, exciting uh, hiking and canoeing and stuff like that in, and then head back down to the lower mainland. But really it's a, once you move here, really it grabs you, grabs hold of you and it's, it's hard to, hard to leave. So it was what, 30, 30, 32 years ago that I, that I came here and, and started uh, practicing as a lawyer for, for um, a number of years. So what happens between those 26 years, between 1992 and 2018, that in 2018, you finally say, okay, enough's enough. I see what's going on in my community. I'm going to put my name forward and give my suggestions and my uh, ideas to the people of the city of Whitehorse. And if they elect me, we'll try and change the way that I see it needs to be changed or work to improve and grow the community. What was happening in 2018 that finally put that spark in your body to say, okay, this is the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I um, I was I had been practicing as a lawyer and did some interesting work uh, in the north. I, I focused on representing uh, former uh, residential Indian residential school students. So I had an opportunity to travel to communities across the north and and all three territories in northern British Columbia. So I got a you know, a good um, sense of what what was out there, the, the the challenges that were out there, the opportunities. And um, back here in Whitehorse, my practice was starting to, to wind up and I was a little too young to retire. Um, and honestly, yeah, I mean, I, I kept up on the news, but just flipping through the newspaper one day, I was reading an article on some discussion that was occurring at city council where council took up 45 minutes of debate on whether they were going to spend $250 on something. I think it was a donation. And I thought, wow, you know, you know, if that's how we're, we're spending our time, um, maybe I could bring something to the discussion. And um, I, I, I love the city. Uh, it's a great city. Um, of course, I had ideas and talking to other people, there were ideas on how we could uh, even make the city better. So I thought, all right, I'll, I'll throw my hat into the ring. Uh, and I ran for council. So um, yeah, I, I, I became a councillor for, for three years here in, uh, here in the Yukon. The terms are three years, that's changing to four. But yeah, so I was a councillor for three years. I loved it. I want to talk about that 2018 campaign for a second, if you don't mind. Because sure. I love I love finding out if the issues that are present in communities like Whitehorse and across Canada are what the media is talking about. We always hear about the macro issues about cities that are going through changes and things that are going on, whether it be education, houselessness, uh, environmental issues. But when you're door knocking, you will hear a range of issues. And I want to know in that 2018 campaign, I know it's about uh, almost if I'm doing my math here correctly, which I can't do correctly right now, five years ago, um, were there more macro issues that were presented to you or were there more micro issues that were presented to you about what was going on in their individual neighborhoods in the city? Uh, I say it's, it was, it was both. And I have to say, even though I was sort of worried about uh, knocking on doors once I got into it. So if anybody's interested in running for politics, and you're a little bit apprehensive once you actually start knocking on doors it's fun because people want to talk to you people want to tell you what the issues are in their neighborhood down the the, the trail there uh or um bigger issues uh housing so it was it was quite a variety uh you know i think housing was big in 2018 across the country it continues to be big uh, uh you know a large issue here that we're all trying to grapple with and and come up with um, creative solutions. Um, uh, crime in 2018, we had a bit of a um, an uptick in sort of uh, petty crime, and it, it just seemed to be kind of the the, the timing. Uh, but it, it it was it was on every agenda. People were asking that at the door when we had um, all candidates meetings. There was questions about what are you going to do uh, about uh, crime, crime in the community. So that that was that was one of the bigger ones. Um, were there issues uh, that you were approached with that 
as someone who had lived in the community for some time, you believe you have a pulse on the community. You believe you have an idea of what the community's wants, needs, issues are. But until you actually go door knocking, you're going to hear some unique issues, some issues that you may not have thought about potentially in a campaign period. Were there issues that surprised you when you were approached, at, when you were knocking on these doors? Uh, yeah, down to details about uh, uh, active transportation. So the cycling community is quite a, an active uh, uh, community here. And, you know, people cycle uh, throughout all four seasons. So minus 40, you'll still see people that are commuting to work on their bikes. And they would very passionate about it and not so much complaining, but trying to give advice on how how to make that um, that experience for cyclists improved and therefore get more people to ride their bikes and drive less we this is a geographically a large city so a lot of people drive here um so you know there would be discussions just about you know when you're laying down the asphalt they would say lay down the asphalt make sure there's there's not a crack or not a space otherwise you know we're, we're tumbling off our bike or when you're building an intersection uh and we gotta push the button to get across the intersection don't put it way over there because i gotta get off my bike you know that sort of thing, or the piling up of snow. So, you know, I'm not a I'm not a computer a commuter on my uh, bike. So those are issues that I wouldn't have known of until I started to engage with, uh, for example, the cycling community. So you learn a lot, and then when you actually get in the seat here, uh, it puts you in a good position to ask questions of administration. Hey, when you're putting in this uh, intersection, or when we're planning that new neighborhood, what are we doing to ensure? That we're supporting um, the active transportation community, so it, it's important. And I can I see now, uh, five years being on council, it works. You you ran in two successful elections. You ran for councillor and then mayor in twenty twenty one. Is there a difference in running uh, a council election in Whitehorse than running a mayor election? Because the issues are going to be the same, but is your answers that you give to the residents different? And I know you're going to say it's probably a little bit different because during 2021 election, COVID-19 was a prominent thing and there are probably a little mm -hmm. bit more restrictions about door knocking. But when you're approached at the door or when you're approaching someone at the door, are you giving the exact same answer as if you would have been just running for councillor as you would be running for mayor? Uh, on on subject matters, yes. But when you're running for mayor, you're running for a, a leadership role. You're, you're you know you're you're expected to lead the team. You're expected to come with experience. So when I ran for council, I, I didn't have experience on. Uh, on council, but I brought a lot of uh, external experience, being uh, you know involved involved in sports, being a, sitting on various boards and committees, uh, being a lawyer. So I was sort of selling myself on that experience is going to help me uh, be a good counselor. But when you're running for mayor, yeah, you, it steps it up a notch. You got to be more than just um, uh, attuned to what the issues are and having good ideas. You've got to show that you're um that you're a leader and and what does that mean um so i thought about that quite a bit before i began my campaign what what do i think is a leader what 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 kind of um characteristics that you need to have and some of those are are listening uh listening first and then talking um to show empathy to show compassion uh to be a good strategist uh so uh, for me, I, I kind of think about the long game, Chris. So what's the long game on this? Am I going to fight? I'm going to fight the territorial government on this one, or I'm going to let it go because the long game is I need a good relationship. The city needs a good relationship with that other level of government. I'm going to let it go and move forward uh, onto other matters. So it, strategizing, working with others, and being creative, being a bit, uh, um, putting yourself out there sometimes to be creative, take some risks, try something new. Uh, sometimes people say, well, you know, this is best practice. And so I would maybe challenge that and say, well, it's best practice, but what's better practice? How do we do this better? Um, so those were some of the qualities I thought uh, made it a little bit different campaigning 
uh, as the mayor. And I was, I actually, I campaigned against two other good candidates. One had no experience at all uh, on city council. And one of them was one of my colleagues. We were, we were both councillors and he'd been a councillor for quite some time. So it was a, it was a good race. Um, it, it was a fun campaign, but um, yeah, I, um, I had a great team behind me and, and we had a good result. I want to talk about something you just said there. You as mayor have to look at the long game and you can't get into the the squabbles that come, sometimes comes with the job of fighting a territorial government or even the federal government on every single issue. But you as mayor have to look at the city as a whole and you have to grow the city as a whole. How do you balance the city growth with the individual growth? Because I can imagine, and I talked to one of your colleagues, uh, Councillor Laking, recently on the show as well, it is probably challenging to balance the needs of your city with the needs of the individual, because the individual believes that their issue is the most important issue at all times. How do you as mayor, as the leader of council, in that leadership role, balance the long game with also the short game because people want to see changes now and not two, three years down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. Um, I think it's important, first of all, that you listen, that you acknowledge uh, those those concerns of of the, the individuals or of a small fraction of your, of your community that you listen, that you hear them um, and you acknowledge that. But I, I think it's you, you got to be careful that, um, as you say, you're you're there to represent all citizens and make make, make decisions that are that are in the best interest of the city and all citizens. So, uh, you know, we we um, will often sort of uh, um, be challenged with uh, one neighborhood or one street asking for something or one individual asking for more. You have to look at it in a big whole whole whole. whole. Uh, you need to balance um, some of your decisions with um, trying to provide as much as you can, uh, but being fiscally responsible all. So it's balancing all of those things. But I think, again, the starting place is to listen to people, be respectful, uh, and, um, and uh, again, go back to we're here to make decisions that are in the best interest of all community uh, members. Making decisions is only one part of the job. Engagement is another because you are there elected, I'm assuming, by the people who have put you there. And when an issue comes in front of you at council, you have to make the best decision for the entire community. And you can't do that by just thinking to yourself, but you have to engage with your residents as a whole. How do you see yourself engaging with not just the echo chamber that is social media, but the people who aren't on social media, the people who may think, you know what, government's doing a good job. My garbage is picked up. My water's turned on when I turn it on. And at the end of the day, I believe my taxes are at a good level. So I'm okay with not giving my opinion. How do you engage with all residents and not just the ones who may seem like they're the constant engagers with I can tell you, as a former administra- administration employee for a municipality, you know the few minority groups that, and I say minority groups as small local uh, voices, who are always giving their opinions. But you can't always just go by those opinions. You have to go with everyone. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's the silent majority that are that are generally fairly you know, satisfied with how things are going. They they like the fact that you've taken some time to establish your strategic priorities and you've given your direction to administration to implement those. Um, and, and then uh, you're, you're passing budget. So you got to You got to stay focused on on, I think, sort of the big picture. And as I just laid it out. Right. Um, council, what are our strategic priorities? All right, we pick six. Now we pass that on to administration. Let's see that in the next budget. Not in the budget. Why is it in the budget? Let's put it in the budget. Maybe it comes in the next budget. So you you know you're sort of developing uh, what you you said you wanted to do, what you had heard from the public, what you needed to do, and you're rolling that out. Now uh, you may have some people sort of uh, commenting, saying do it this way, do it that way, and and they're they're sort of the loud minority. Um, you have to listen to that, but I, you know, I don't, I'm not, 
honestly, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook and scrolling and certainly not responding. There's a professional way to respond to people. I mean, do that. But there's other ways that you can engage too. Just in mean, a small town like this, walking down the street, people want to talk to you. Totally open to that. Um, uh, I have people that still write letters and will res respond to that. Phone calls. Um, the mayor, the mayor will 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 meet with people or meet with organizations. Um, having open dialogue, regular meetings with um, our First Nation uh, governments here. We we do that. I have regular meetings with our community services minister um, once every two weeks. If I have an issue that is another minister's um, portfolio, I you know I'm in a good situation here where I can text them, phone them, and say this is something we need to talk about. Can we set up a meeting? Uh, so open lines of communication, all different kinds. But yeah, it's you. Is you it hard to have... say no? Is it hard to say no? Because I can imagine there's probably people who come to your community to you and uh, suggest ideas to make the community better. And you have to look at the financial, the bottom dollar, and not everything is going to be solved. And you may have to say no. Has it become easier to say no? Or do you not say no when you say something else? Uh, it, no, I, I do say no, because you have to say no. <laughs> Uh, you, say, you have to be honest. You have to be honest and open. And people quite, I, I find that people dislike it when you're honest and frank. So if somebody <laughs> says, can you do this? And you say, well, you know what? That's no, we can't. I mean, that costs hundreds of millions of dollars. We don't have it. So no, that, love your idea. Uh, but no, we can't do that. Or uh, can you do uh, something, uh, for example, um, that falls within the territorial health and social services? jurisdiction. Maybe it's uh, building housing for homeless or setting up a, a safe injection site. That's a great idea, but no, I we can't do that. It's not the city of White Horse's uh, um, legislative authority. Support you on it. We'll work with the territorial government or the federal government, but that's not that's, that's not within our legislative authority. So it's, yeah, it's okay to say no. And I think if you Again, if you listen to people uh, and are respectful, um, they're okay with your answer. They move on, and um, yeah, I think I think being being frank and being open is is appreciated. At least I've found it in in the way that I've uh, acted as a mayor and as a counselor. One last question before we turn to the city as a whole, and that is uh, something you just mentioned there, the misunderstanding that people may have when it comes to what the role of the municipal government is. Um, I've talked to many councillors and mayors from across this country. And one thing I hear over and over again is people, residents will come to them with provincial matters, territorial matters. They will come with federal matters. But I, I play devil's advocate with the guests whenever I have them on. So I'm going to play it with you a little bit. They're not talking to you because they don't know sometimes. They're talking to you because you're an elected official who is hopefully going to work with them to better their community. So when they talk to you about safe injection sites or uh, affordable housing, they're not talking to you and hoping that you just pass them off to the provincial government. They're hoping that you will work with them. Do you find that in your job as mayor of the city, people are coming to you and hopefully getting some answers on federal or even territorial matters that while you don't have jurisdiction, they're hoping that you can have a solution to help solve. Uh, for sure. And, and <laughs> big uh, question. I apologize. <laughs> you know, my, and my response would be not to pass the buck, but just set out the facts and, and then say, um, but if, the, if there's a role for the city of Whitehorse uh, in this issue, um, We'll be there. We'll be there to support the territorial government. We'll be there to support the federal government. Um, and we'll, we'll do whatever we can. Um, I, I just started this um, this housing uh, um, roundtable with the main elected leaders in, in my community here. Two ministers, one of them, well, actually, the, the premier minister, two chiefs, and our MP from the Yukon. And it's a roundtable. It's like what and we go around the table what housing initiative are you working on right now do you have any barriers well the funding or zoning and then so then you look around the table who can help with this problem 
Uh, so it's just, it's very high level sharing information because housing is really important here, sharing information on what you're doing, what you need and who around the table might be able to help you. So uh, that's the perspective that I come from. I'm not going to pretend I'm not the federal uh, minister or federal MP, or I'm not the, not the premier, but as the, as the leader of the city of Whitehorse, the capital city here in the Yukon, uh, if it's not within my bailiwick, I, I'll see if I can direct it or partner up uh, in some way to uh, to find a solution to your problem. Thank you. I want to turn to the city as a whole now. And before I mention this, the, ask the first question, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is her opinion. This is not a motion of council, a direction of council. I seem to get very weird emails whenever I ask this question because people seem to assume that this is the what's going on in council. But no, it's her opinion. Uh, mayor Cabot. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Whitehorse as of recording this episode right now? Uh, I'm going to give you three. Uh, yep. Infrastructure funding, housing, and climate change. Okay. I want to talk about infrastructure right now. Sure. You are not, you are not the only community, and I've talked to a few municipalities in the Yukon that is facing the infrastructure deficit. And you are hopefully having conversations with the territorial government to hopefully rectify this or even FCM and the federal government. What are you doing as mayor and council to address this issue in the short term until the funding announcements, until the dollars start rolling to your city to try and solve these issues? Because I, I'm assuming you do not want to raise your taxes to offset the uh, deficit that you're seeing in the infrastructure funding to your taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So quick answer. What are we doing? Um, we've, we've dipped into our reserves a little bit more than in this last uh, budget cycle than we may have in the past. Uh, we increased taxes uh, a small amount, but you know, typically the taxes here in Whitehorse, are um, to 2.3%. So this year we raised it to 3.3%. Uh, so increase the taxes a little bit. Uh, and again, dipped into our, our reserves. We're prioritizing the projects that need to happen. Uh, we're knocking off projects, like just taking them off of our capital budget, provisional budgets into the future, or just saying, I don't see this happening. It's it, it's a nice to have, but we've got so many things that we must do. So we just you know delete it uh, from any uh, draft budget um, and making the dollar stretch as far as we can. Uh, we've had some some emergency situations, some interruptions where we've had to um, uh, forego ten of our gas tax uh, projects because we need to invest in. Uh, in some um, infrastructure, some water, water and sewer, sewer line that are impacted by climate change. So that's disappointing, but uh, that's that becomes a priority over the the ten other items that you you also needed to do. Prioritizing is the key word I want to play on here for a few seconds, if you don't mind, because. Yeah. Over the last few years, municipalities across this country have been facing some struggles because over the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people were struggling and municipalities reduced services, reduced costs, even tried to keep that tax increase to the bare minimal for the majority of that time. Um, prioritizing is kind of a big thing right now. Are you struggling to try to keep in mind with what you talked about in our earlier part of the interview of the long game with prioritizing what needs to be done, but also remember that you are playing the long game to make sure that the city grows in a sustainable fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then on top of that, I think uh, every year you see uh, expectations from citizens to, to, to take on more things that aren't typically within uh, you know, the municipal uh, services. Um, yeah, so again, I think it's um, it's looking at uh, projects. And I mean, you know, if you had if you had a unlimited, if you had a limited uh, amount of money, which we do, you always look for what are the priorities? Well, it's water, it's water, right? 
uh, you, you have to provide clean water. So we're looking at uh, maybe having to invest uh, in $40 million in a secondary water treatment plant. We know what happened to Iqaluit, uh when, when their water treatment um, system uh, broke down. Uh, it was expensive. It was inconvenient. So we're we're looking at that, and forty million dollars is, is a lot of money when we when we just passed uh, what was it about a fifty two million dollar capital budget. So it's it's a smallish uh, budget when you're looking at those um, uh, other other expenditures coming up. I mean, over the next five years, we've we've done our homework on this, Chris. So over the next five years, we estimate we have about a quarter of a million dollars in basic basic infrastructure uh, for the city. And that doesn't that doesn't include um, the infrastructure needed to support housing, right? So a lot of people sort of get it mixed up. Let's just build houses, build houses. You need the money uh, for infrastructure, um, pipe in the ground, um, roads, clearing, planning, all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, we'll, that that's something that we'll be needing as well. So, um, is the housing industry, because you talked about that was one of the issues that you're facing as the city. Mm-hmm. When you say housing, are you just saying, uh, accessible housing, access to housing or, uh, d- different types of housing? What are you talking about when that is an issue for the city of Whitehorse? Housing across the spectrum. And I think it's really easy to sort of, uh, uh, get forced into focusing in one type of housing, whether it's accessible housing or affordable housing. And I, in, in my community here in Whitehorse, it is housing across the spectrum. So we have people that are homeless and need a, need, need a home. We have people that can afford an affordable home. You know, there are young professionals that are returning uh, from, from university uh, or, you know, we're, we're looking for nurses, teachers. So, you know, they, they make a, a, a good living. Um, they need homes, whether it's um, rental or, or, or buying a home. So those as well. And then all the way to the, you know, the, the, to the other side where people that have a lot of money uh, and uh, just want to, you know, have a nice, nice, nice sized house with it, with a yard. So it's across the spectrum. And this is, this is a bit of a, a pet peeve of mine. If we, if we just focus on one type of housing and ignore the other, you're not supporting your community. So if all we build in this city is um, uh, affordable housing or housing for uh, homeless, um, then we don't have housing to support that um, those people. We don't have housing to uh, for social workers, for firefighters, for teachers, for counselors, for um, um, equipment operators. So that's why I think it's really important for municipalities to to um, stay broad and, and ensure that you're providing housing for uh, all members of your um, city. Is there a broad desire to do the broad housing challenge to make sure it's not just the one type of housing that people are building, but or developers are building, I apologize, and actually develop all types of housing? Or uh, because there is a big talk, and I'm assuming you hear it all the time too, affordable housing is the thing that we all need to prioritize right now. But you're right, we do need to broaden our scopes and not just think about affordable housing, but all housing. So is there desire in Whitehorse from developers or even developers outside of the uh, the city to come in and build that broad spectrum of housing that you are talking about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, our, our fastest growing uh, neighborhood is called Whistle Bend, uh, and uh, it's probably about half built out now. There'll be uh, uh, a, another a couple of thousand houses that will be built there in the next um next few years and it's 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 mixed it's sing, single single dwelling uh, townhouses apartment buildings all of that stuff is being uh built in that new neighborhood as well the city is because we're, we're trying to be a sustainable city uh and keeping in mind climate change and, and our impact we're, we're doing we're looking at infill areas we just passed our official community plan big focus there is looking at areas where we can do uh, infill. And so again, do some densification, do housing that is um, 
affordable, housing that is close to the city, housing that is close to a grocery store, close to transit, bike uh, bike trails. So trying to build out housing in a smart way, but again, across the spectrum. And the city has, we have a development incentive program. So if you are a developer, you wanna build rental housing, you wanna build high density housing, you're going to get you know, free money from the city of Whitehorse because we need you to do that. And it works pretty good. It, it works pretty good. So we do have um, uh, a lot of broad spectrum housing uh, going on in the city for sure. Is NIMBYism an issue up in Whitehorse? You know, I sure, but I think sometimes, you know, it's, you know, is it NIMBYism or is it people that are just really care, you know, really care about their neighborhood, really care about their, um, their lifestyle and i think again i go back to it's important to listen to people so if you're doing infill and it, it's a place that was you know it's it's it's, it's got trees it's a small forest and people like to walk their dogs there kids like to play there i get it why it's important for them but i think so you, you need to listen to that and you need to try and um you know find solutions and we're lucky here in the city of Whiters. You don't have to walk very far. You're going to find another trail. You're going to find another little forest. You're going to find um, a, another place to walk your dog. So it's listening to that, those concerns, and working with uh, the community to um, try and achieve what you've been asked to do, uh, which is build build homes, but be sympathetic and respectful for the things that they're looking for. So, you know, I, I, I think... Often it's not necessarily NIMBYism. It's people that care and, and want to be heard. So I, I told you at the beginning of this, we'd be 40 minutes. We're almost at the 40 minute marks. And I want to talk about climate okay. change because I know uh, that is an important issue, particularly on what just happened in the city just recently, uh, about uh, four or five weeks ago. But then I want to turn to my next bit. So I'm going to try and do this as quick as possible for you. Okay. So mm -hmm. you said that climate change is one of the biggest one of, one of the top three issues that is facing the city of Whitehorse. What do you mean yeah. by that? Well, uh, it's two things. It's uh, what we're doing as a city to um, uh, reduce climate change, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce our, our our footprint. So what are we doing as a corporate city there and how are we also encouraging the community to to reduce that? And then the second thing is, it's and it's big in the north here, Chris, is adapting to the fact that climate change is here and how to, how to adapt, how to be resilient, how to respond. So it's always been um, the responsibility of, of council to uh, invest in infrastructure, uh, you know, to keep an eye on what's, what's getting old uh, and, and invest in that. Uh, but it's, I think that it's, um, it's doubly important now because infrastructure is, is, uh, is maybe getting older faster because of the impacts of climate change. So, uh, you know, we see that here. Um, where are you seeing um, it on a regular basis, though? Are you seeing it? Because I know, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, because I, I I did a little bit of research after you, we had to reschedule this interview. But there was a recent mud uh, uh, yeah. a slide or a mudslide or a water slide in one of the areas of your city, which caused some damage to a sort of hill that is prominent in your community. Mm. Yeah, so the city of Whitehorse, is, the downtown is located in a river valley. And so one side of the, the river valley is a large escarpment. Above that is the airport. And that, you know, that escarpment or clay cliffs have been there for, for you know, thousands and thousands of years and slowly erodes uh, generally. But in the last two years with climate change, we've had double the amount of snowfall. The, uh, the escarpment, the clay cliffs are saturated. And in the spring, when it uh, warms up and the water's got to go somewhere, it's pulling all the trees, debris, dirt down off the escarpment and onto the road. And, and one of the, we only have two uh, road accesses in and out of the city. And uh, yeah, there was, a, there was a slide last year that shut the road down, one of the roads for, for six weeks. And we knew it was going to come back again this year because we don't have a long-term solution yet. So it uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had another slide. And um, it's the escarpment is quite vulnerable. Uh, we were doing a lot of monitoring of it. We've got geotechnical uh, experts. Uh, it's 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 dangerous. We've we've shut off not only the road, but some of the um, the very popular trails in White Or. So that is a perfect example of climate change. Something we didn't expect to to um, 
to deal with, to to pay for. It's two point three million dollars last year, uh, but the the you know the the um, and it'll probably cost that cost the same um, this year. And Chris, the you know the long term solution for this one is going to be in the millions of dollars. Whether you're reprofiling the escarpment, and that's that's a lot of work, or you're 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 building a, a, a road or a, a bridge out over the Yukon River. Um, so uh, big challenges ahead of us there on, on that one, but um, you no, know, it, it it's part of the job. I want to turn to my last segment and this is, this is the fun one to end on a positive note, because I know the city's going through some challenges as you've just laid out, but I like talking about tourism. As I told uh -huh. Councillor Laking, I am going to be up in Whitehorse. We've actually planned it. We're going to be there in July. So get ready to cool. see Chris Brown in the city of Whitehorse later on this year. So awesome. Mayor, in your opinion, yeah. what are some of the hidden gems in the city of Whitehorse that people need to visit and at me as a tourist need to see when I'm in Whitehorse this year? Uh, well, gee, there's so much. I don't know how long you're staying for a couple of months and you might hit some of them. Um, the, 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 our, our tagline is the wilderness city. So let's start with that. So if you, if you're interested in, uh, uh mountain biking we have 800 kilometers of trails within the municipal boundary all right uh 200 of those are maintained the other 600 that aren't maintained they're just as fun so if you're into mountain biking hiking uh we have the yukon river that uh, comes uh, comes through through uh the the city here a lot of history around the yukon river going back to first nations uh, uh culture to the gold rush uh, so the Yukon River is, is, is fascinating. Um, we have similar to other places, but I think I think it's probably done a little bit better here. We have got some fantastic craft breweries. So if you're interested in testing out some of the beer, uh, local food, you know, there uh, don't dismiss us because, you know, we're we're in the north. But there's a lot of agriculture going on here, whether it's um, elk, beef, bison, chicken. Uh, fresh produce, produce. So a lot of the restaurants here will serve uh, local food, and um, yeah, so that's that's delicious. Um, if you came in the winter, Chris, I would say uh, skiing. We've got a fantastic downhill uh, ski um, uh, facility, and in fact, because it's cold here early, and we can make snow early, we have uh, national um ski skiers that come here and train here in, in Whitehorse if you're into the more working out sort of part of things we have um uh, a world class cross country ski facility uh you know sports something here for are, everything it sounds like something for everyone uh museums we have all sorts of museums really um sort of uh interesting you're stuff speaking my language there. now <laughs> Okay. Um, but it sounds like there's yeah, something so, for everything. So I'm going to end on this question because I'm cautious of time, Mayor, and sure. you're a busy woman. Um, in your opinion, what makes the city of Whitehorse such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, I would start with the, the, the natural outdoors. It, it's right here on your uh in your back door it's not unusual to see a bear it's not unusual to see a moose I mean, driving home from work if you saw a moose well, it would be we don't it's not a daily occurrence but yeah we see that uh so the natural environment it it is it is beautiful here and then we have access to um the mountains lakes and, and all the activities that you can do around there this city is very inclusive and I haven't yet had a chance to say that, but you know, even in the winter, when I first moved here, you had that sort of the skidoers and the cross country skiers and got along like the skidoers were respectful to the cross country skiers. And as, as a cross country skier, you always loved skiing on a skidoo track. So it, it's, um, you have quite a variety of people here, but we, 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 we get along. Um, so I, I would say that that's, uh, that's definitely unique. And, um, I think also it may have taken some time, but we're in a good place now where, um, we have a very diverse community from around the world, but also we're very proud 
and uh, of our First Nations people that um, traditionally are from this area. And um, whether we're working with them on housing developments or recognizing uh, Orange Shirt Day or what have you, we have a, I, I would say we're pretty proud of our relationship both with the Tong Quatrain Council and the Kwan Dun First Nation. Mayor, you just painted an amazing photo and I can imagine that's why you stayed there after 1992 and you've just loved it since. And I'm so looking forward to coming up to Whitehorse later on this year and experiencing what you've just laid out and what Councillor Laking laid out earlier this year on the show. Uh, I, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about yourself, your community, and of course, tourism, because that's one of the big things. Uh, very much appreciative. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure, Chris. Always love to talk about uh, the best city in the country and look forward to your visit. Will do. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. You'd be surprised at how much it can better us as a people, but better society. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.